However, as time progressed, the Six Kingdoms scheme became more accepted where the, you now have the, the, the separation of the Monera into two more kingdoms. You now have the U-bacteria, which are unicellular prokaryotic, and RK-bacteria, which are also unicellular and prokaryotic. A great difference was observed between the two, U-bacteria and RK-bacteria, so they were separated into different kingdoms. However, as we will be taking note later, archaebacteria is already an obsolete word. It is now known as archaea. Eubacteria is also obsolete. It is now known as simply bacteria. Now, in addition to these two prokaryotic kingdoms, uh, you also have the eukaryotic kingdoms, which would be the protista, the fungi, the animalia, and the plantae. So this would now be called the six kingdom scheme which is accepted by many universities and textbooks today. Now, the modern, uh, modern taxonomy, we mentioned the early versions of taxonomies and phylogenies. Now we talked about the modern taxonomy. Now, the modern taxonomy relies heavily on comparing DNA and comparing RNA and comparing proteins. So we, now, we are now employing molecular biology in the study of modern taxonomy to help identify, to help classify, uh, to help name organisms. The mo and this is one important, important uh, fact or information that we need to take note of. The more similar the nucleic acids and proteins are between two organisms, the more closely related they are considered to be. Now, this is, this this idea is very elementary or it, it is you know, uh, very valid because if we look at, for example, brothers and sisters, the more closer you are, the more that you look like each other as compared to, to cousins, first, first, uh, first degree cousin, second degree, third degree cousin. So they look a little more different than as siblings are. So the idea simply is the more that the nucleic acid proteins are the same, it is highly likely that the or two organisms are closely related to each other, especially in the evolutionary perspective. Now, in the 1970s, there are two important people here, Carl Woos, who is given in this picture, and George Fox, who is given in this picture. Now, these two, import, these two people created a genetics-based tree of life, phylogeny, which was based on the similarities and differences observed in the small subunit ribosomal RNA. Now, the, 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 the basic idea here is that they chose a certain type of nucleic acid that they observed to be conserved in different or on all, in all of the different kinds of organisms. In other words, kinanap nila yung isang nucleic acid na hindi nagbabago o napakabagal ng pagbabago through the different organisms or through the different kinds of organisms in this world. And they were... Now, in the 1970s, the American microbe... Now, in the 1970s, two important people, Carl Woos, who is given, shown in this picture, and George Fox, who is shown in the picture below, they created a genetics-based tree of life, phylogeny, based on the similarities and differences observed in the small subunit ribosomal RNA of different organisms. And the reason that they made use of this is because they observed that this particular nucleic acid is conserved throughout all organisms. When we say they are con it is conserved, hindi nagbabago masyado, it, o hindi nakitaan ng masyadong pagbabago itong nucleic acid na ito. And they thought to compare the nucleic acid sequence of a highly conserved, not changing sequence. And it was very interesting that in the process, they discovered the certain type of bacteria called archaebacteria, now known as archaea, which we shown in the Six Kingdom scheme a while ago. They discovered this group. Significantly, there is a great difference between the bacteria and the eukaryotes in terms of the sequence of small subunit 
our RNA. Now, because of this, the Six Kingdom scheme was born. At the same time, they created a tree with three domains above the level of kingdom. And the three domains would be the Archaea, the Bacteria, and also the Eukarya. As you can see in the picture here, the Bacteria is over here. The Archaea will be over here, and the Eukarya will be over here. All of these that can be seen here are microorganisms, while the animals, the fungi, and the plants will be the macroorganism. Another thing that we will be noticing is that there is a common point for all three domains at this particular point, and this is what we call as LUCA LUCA, or the or the last unicellular common ancestor. So this would be the LUCA, the, lo the last unicellular common ancestor, common uh, the ancestor of the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Now, you will be noticing something here in the picture, and this would be very important. You will notice that the archaea is evolutionarily closer to the eukarya. The archaea is actually farther in evolutionary terms to the bacteria. We'll talk about that in a little bit while. This suggests that archaea, bacteria, eukaryotes all evolved from a common ancestral cell type, which we call as LUCA a while ago. And the tree shows that the archaea and the eukarya are more evolutionary closer than they are to bacteria. Now, Let's now proceed with nomenclature. Now, we already know the evolutionary history, the phylogeny of the different organisms, at least in the tree kingdom scheme, a tree domain scheme. Now, well, let's look at how organisms are named scientifically. Now, Linnaeus made use of a system called the binomial nomenclature. Binomial meaning two names. So this is a two-word naming system and used to identify the organism using the genus name and also the species name. So there are two names here, genus and species. In the binomial nomenclature, please take note that the genus part of the name is always capitalized while the species name that follows after the genus will always be not capitalized. On the other hand, both will be italicized, especially when it is typed. But if it is written, it is underlined. Okay, here's an example of the binomial name, Leptinotarsa decemlinieta. The, or, the genus name is capitalized, the specific or the species name or the specific epithet is not capitalized and both names would be italicized. But you have to handwrite this or you have to write it by hand. You will put an underline under the genus name and another underline under the specific epithet or the species name. Now the taxonome, how do you actually give the names? Now in the 18th and 20th, through 20th century, typically the names were simply derived from Latin. And if you will be noticing the original name of Car Carolus Linnaeus, Carl von Linne, but he Latinized in his name into Carolus and also Linnaeus. Now, the reason why Latin was used in the 18th and the 20th century is because uh, the common language used by scientists at that time, especially for taxonomic systems, was Latin. So there, uh, today, there are many eponyms in science. When we need eponym, name given to a person, place, or a thing after the discoverer. So aside from using Latinized words, which characterizes certain traits of the organism, other ways of naming organisms are employed right now. It can be a name of a person or a name of a place, a name of a thing, or even the name of the discoverer himself or herself. So here's an example. The Archaeon Halo Quadratum Walsh BE. In, this is an example of a binomial name. The Halo Quadratum, which is the genus, Describes the microorganism salt water habitat. So halo meaning salt, as well as the arrangement of the square cells, which is quadra four, clusters of four cell, and quadratum arranged in square clusters of four cells. So very interesting that in making, in using or making the scientific name, we make note 
take note of certain traits of the organism. Another thing here is the last name, which is Walsby. It is named after Anthony Edward Walsby, who was the microbiologist who discovered this particular organism. So very interesting. So many other organisms are named after characteristics, after names, or after places. Now, how do we actually name, how do we actually uh, group or classify or even identify organisms? Well, uh, Burgess Manual of Determinative Bacteriology and Burgess Manual of Systematic Bacteriology is used in order to do the important task in taxonomy. So this was first published in 1923. And this is the standard reference for identifying, classifying different prokaryotes. And it also helped in identifying and classifying micro, other microorganisms. And this is a picture of the determinative bacteriology. Now this ends our discussion on unit one. And in the next video, we'll be discussing about unit two, which is the chemistry of life. I'll see you next time and have a great day.